Welcome to this module where we're going to put all the information you've learned in previous modules and understand how to develop a prioritized problem list. I'm going to show you a couple of cases of my own where we developed a problem list and then treatment plan according to that. It can be all be really overwhelming, but I would say it all starts from good records, taking good records, analyzing them, and then developing in a structured format is going to help you get there. So let's start to unravel problem list. Well, number one is if you see anything normal or abnormal, especially abnormal, list them all. Okay, try to create categories. So skeletally, is the maxilla at fault? Is the mandible at fault? Or are they normal? Let's look at in three dimensions as well. Dentally, is there any if problems with the occlusion, the current occlusion? What's the alignment, the amount of crowding? Dental health. List everything initially. Soft tissues, what's the gingival biotype like? Is there any periodontal issues? Musculature, how's the muscle tone like? Mucosa, any habits that we've detected that are abnormal? Then look at aesthetics. What about smile display? What about the motivation of the patient? The chin and nasal projection. What about the incisal display, gum display? Okay, radiographs come quite later on down the track. They're simply correlating your clinical findings or confirming or negating them. So what do the x-rays show us? What about treatment time, motivation, financial, all of that? What is the patient's expectation? General dental treatment, anything that has to occur before treatment, during, after, or has already been done, and what needs to be um, uh, concerned here. Where's the growth status of this patient? Are they prepubertal, pubertal, or postpubertal? We'll go more into growth lectures later on. But most importantly, your treatment objectives should always go back to the patient's chief concern. Prioritize that. What is the one thing they would like to change and why? And how soon they'd like to change it? And what concerns them the most are the most important questions to ask. So all my treatment planning um, and establishing the aims will also follow that format where we look at skeletal and we're going to look at in three dimensions, transverse, vertical and anteroposterior. Are we going to change any of this? Dental, are we going to fix the crowding or spacing? Are we going to change the canine relationship, the molar relationship and incisor positions? Soft tissue, are we going to improve lip competency? Are we going to give better smile aesthetics and how? Habits, are we going to change any habits or we accept them? Are we going to change in size or display? And quality of life, so lifestyle, travel, pain, these kind of things. If I really give you a cookbook approach, I would say something like this. Non-extraction is less than 10 millimeter crowding, deep bite cases, narrow arches, class 2 div 2, you never extract in that, retroclin incisors and thin upper lips. I don't believe that is the best way of going about doing orthodontics. If you followed cookbook and did not look at each patient as an individual, you will be erroneously led to the wrong diagnosis and treatment plan. I've seen that time and time again. Um, in fact, that many times that I want to brainwash cookbook approaches out of you. Um, so what if we had to do something non-extraction and this crowding? Well, we know ways to create space are things like expansion. So for every millimeter of premolar expansion, we'll gain 0.5 to 0.7 millimeter in the arch. For every one millimeter of incisor proclination, we gain two millimeter in the arch. Now, as I said, incisor proclination is a very powerful way of creating space because it's one to two. Uh, in fact, maxillary expansion is not the most powerful way of creating space. IPR could be done between 0.2 to 0.5 millimeter per contact quite safely if the technique is right. And distalization can also create space for us up to two millimeters is very predictable. So what should our treatment planning sequence be? I always say transverse first. Always think about where is our maxillary arch going to be and then where is our mandibular arch going to be and how we're going to coordinate this. Then comes vertical control and anteroposterior, and often they go hand in hand. AP changes like changing class two to class one will often have a vertical effect as well. And we'll discuss that more in later modules. So transverse first, how much expansion is needed? Is this going to be skeletal or dental? Um, how much growth is remaining? Uh, is growth being completed? That has a big factor in it. 
So let's look at developing a problem list and then a treatment plan for two children here. And one of them, the difference is one of them is skeletal class two, the other one is a dental class two, but a skeletal class one. So let's look into this. So this is a girl, it's quite obvious, she's got mandibular retrognathia, she's class two division one, she's got the typical lower lip trap you can see in her extra oral photograph. Her profile looks convex. So she is actually a class two division one malocclusion skeletal and dental. And her treatment would be very different to someone else. Now you're seeing here uh, many things. You can see the increase in overjet. You can see that um, her lower incisors are retroclined um, and it might indicate that she had a prolonged thumb sucking habit. Um, you can also see that her upper incisors go up in a reverse shape like a reverse arc so it's a reverse smile arc. She's relatively early in presentation. She's only under 11 years of age and her biggest chief concern was front teeth sticking out and being teased at school. So her dental history is pretty good. She had no restorations. Her habits, she was mouth breathing. She had a lower lip sucking habit partly because of the increased overjet and a tongue thrust swallow because of also the, the non-incisal contact at class 2 division 1. So when we look at her face, we say she's mesofacial, she's kind of tending a little bit dolicofacial because she has an open mouth posture, but her symmetry was within normal limits. Um, we, we can see her facial thirds mildly increased, maybe almost normal, and her lip pattern, she definitely have a hyperactive mentalis and a breathing pattern. So there's nasal and mouth breathing and TMJ was none, previous therapy was none. When we look at her smile, she's displaying premolar to premolar, 100% of her incisor width, uh, probably a little bit of a narrow smile. There's no canting of her occlusal plane or gingival um, plane and there's 100% incisal display. When we look at her profile, she's convex, her nasal labial angle is about 80 degrees. Um, her lip projections thin. Make sure when you see a profile photograph, lips are unstrained because if they're strained, it will give you the wrong nasolabial angle. The mandibular plane angle here looks flat. The throat length looks really short. Chin prominence is reduced and it's, she's a little bit um, uh, hyperdivergent. So what kind of teeth are erupted? When we look at the intraoral frontal photograph, you want to work out midlines. Is the lower off from the upper? Um, what teeth are present? When we look at buckle shots, you want to look at canine relationship and molar. In this case, she's class two on both sides. What's the overjet? Uh, measuring it clinically is very important. Um, how protrusive are the upper incisors? How retruded are the lower incisors? arch forms um, what's happening with our OPG what's happening with the Ceph so we develop a problem list that is now orthodontic problem list talking about the skeletal dental soft tissue and quality of life as well this is a diagnostic summary for her she has a class 2 division 1 skeletal and dental malocclusion on a class 2 skeletal base which has mandibular retrognathia but with good smile aesthetics. She has abnormal soft tissue habits and pubertal growth spurt coming very soon. We'll talk more about how to detect pubertal growth spurt. So this is the areas we have to work out what we're gonna do for her in treatment planning. So let's look at how we established her aims. We know there's some growth left, so we decided to actually expand her maxilla. We know that she's mandibular retrognathic, so we'd like, because there's still growth left, we'd like to do some mandibular advancement therapy. Dentally, we want to reduce her overjet. We want to get a canine and molar relationship that's class one and improve her incisor angulations. Soft tissue wise, it'd be nice to improve her lip competency and eliminate the lower lip trap. Maintain her incisal display because that's perfect. And quality of life, you know, she's been teased. We don't want to put anything that's going to affect her speech. Now, uh, big acrylic plates and removable appliances have been known to uh, uh, have speech impediments. So, um, you know, we didn't want to give her that. She, she had already been diagnosed in treatment plan for a herbst, a fixed class two corrector, which she refused because of discomfort and pain. Um, so we decided on going with maybe braces or aligners. You could do it with both. 
So this is a class two division one occlusion that has to be changed to that. Okay, and now because growth is on your side, this makes it a bit easier. So we basically list down all our treatment options. What if no treatment is always an option? What if we do no treatment? What are the risks? So one of the risks would be because growth is complete, if she decided to go for treatment at the age of 18, it most likely would be surgical therapy or it would actually have to be extractions. Um, orthodontics only is going to rely on some growth modification which if we get a positive response might benefit her. And if growth is completed, there is no other option but ideal treatment would be orthognathic surgery. So by listing these options, you are now starting to develop an informed consent process for the child and the parent. So I'm going to stop here to actually uh, pause and reflect on this case. Um, I know I said there were two kids at the start of the lecture. In your handouts, you see the second one. I want you to consider this for every patient of yours. Develop a prioritized problem list in this format. In your download section, you have templates that give you the PowerPoint and Keynote templates to develop something like this for your own patients. All you need to do is um, drop in the right records and analyze them and develop it and submit it for requirements of completing this course. Good luck and I will see you soon.